Classic Ristos is proudly brought to you by Shannon's Insurance, where you can be a member of the Shannon's Club. Pace Farm, the enjoyable egg. Hair and Forbes Machinery House. And Gun Lake Quarries. Like to see a Ford Falcon that was literally taken to new heights and a motoring museum? Well, stick around and enjoy this week's episode of Classic Restos. Back in the 1960s, the mighty Ford Falcon rose to the top in quite a few areas. But what we have here is over the top. You might have heard about it. You might have seen it in a book. Well, I have come to a private location here in regional Victoria to show you the famous Ford Falcon stuck up high in the fork of an Aussie gum tree. And to tell us more... Here is Eddie Ford. Well, we'd had the Ford book with the, with the Holden in the tree and um, we thought it's a good, a good talking point to put on a book because people, well, you know, falcon in a tree was a, was a good one and I, the old falcon was sitting up the farm as the first model and uh, we found a suitable tree which was up on the back blocks and I rented this big crane that come in and lifted it. And it had been in the digital age, we'd have taken it down, but I thought if we don't, if we take it down and someone messes up with the development of the film, then we've got to do it again. So we decided to leave it there and it's been there since 1983. <laughs> yeah, well, we're only about, we're only about a thousand feet above the flood line. And then some people said, oh, Maybe the tree grew up and it just lifted it because you see pictures of cars growing through trees. Well, I think <laughs> that tree would have had to be been about 100 years old to have lifted the falcon. The falcon had been long gone. And then other people said, oh, I think it's in California because they have gum trees there. And there was, there was all sorts of... The talk on the internet was, was most amusing, actually. Well, first of all, they, it was facing face down and then there was a limb propping the back. Well, as the tree kept moving, the car kept slipping down. It put too much weight on the limb at the back and it snapped the limb off. And then other people come and they shot all the windows out. And it was a bit of target practice then. But I think one day someone, someone may take it out of the tree and restore it. And I'd probably have a very famous, famous car. Well, I had a 1960 Falcon I'd bought back about 1970 and uh, I bought it as a parts car, but the old Falcon didn't need the parts and it just sat there and sat there. So that's where it ended up. And as we didn't have to go and buy it and it was the first model, I thought it was an ideal one to put in the tree on our Ford book. Yeah, well, we mainly do Restored Car Magazine. We've been doing that since 1973. We've outlasted most around the countryside. We're just a family, small operation and uh, in the day of magazines and books not doing too well and they're probably due to the internet and everything else I think we've survived pretty good we've outlasted a few yeah we're very th very thrilled to see our classic restos restos and Fletch here and uh, we've seen him on TV and it's good good to be here for him <laughs> The township of Portland here in Victoria has a lot of attributes and on a mechanical level the Classics by the Bay car show provides some real spotlight emphasis. But here in Portland there's also a motor museum. These museums, they're becoming rare in Australia so we have to support them and embrace them at every opportunity that we can. The Portland Powerhouse Motor and Car Museum is run by the Portland Vintage Car Club Incorporated and look what they have done to showcase such an impressive collection. Even the building outside plants the intrigue to want to come inside and like most historic museums in country towns their own mechanical history plays a major role. 
Yeah, my name's Bill Sandyman. Um, I'm the president of the Portland Powerhouse Car Club. Um, the car club was started in 1971 um, by a handful of men and it was um, affiliated with the Mount Gambia Car Club. Uh, eventually Portland decided to go on their own and eight or ten original members decided they needed a shed to park their excess cars. The original powerhouse shed in Portland um, which housed a generator and generated Portland electricity in the early days, uh, was available and they approached the Shire. Um, the Shire willingly gave it to them. Um, and then they opened a, the shed up by appointment for people to have a look at these cars. Eventually the idea grew, uh, they expanded. Uh, they could see that there was an opportunity, opportunity with the help of the Shire to create a large museum. They scrounged to, to get money. They um, did everything on their own with the help of the Shire and they, um, the Shire eventually came on board. They extended the building and created the museum in 90, uh, 30 years back this year. And it's just grown from then. So it's a credit to those men and women to have the foresight to create this because we now have a membership of just on 100 people the museum's open 363 days a year, uh, all run by volunteers and members. Everything in the museum is owned by the, either the car club or members. Cars are quite often exchanged over because members have more than one car, so they swap them around. Um, and it's all done on a voluntary basis. And it's a credit for a small car club of 100 people to have this facility. Yeah, when people um, walk through the door here, it's really the wow factor because they don't expect the inside to be like it is. We have a, a range of 30 or plus cars, um, earliest being a, a 1909 black, right up to the latest produced Australian Valiant. We also have a TV here with monitoring early monitor with early um, Holden HQ advertising, as well as, as Valiant and Mini Mokes, etc. Uh, and that's a real appealing to people as they walk through the door. And I can remember this you know, back when I was in my late teenagers. Um, the Holden dealership driving team uh, where they had four HQ Monaros and they raced side by side, so they put them over jumps, um, they did circle work with them, all precision. Um, this is back in the days before they had any electronic aids. Um, and it was a credit, the HQs were a wonderful car produced, produced by Australia. Yeah, and this all stems back to um, when Australia had three or four car manufacturing. They had Ford, Holden, Chrysler, BMC, and that was a proud country making proud products. If you're coming to Portland, please come down to see us. Uh, you'll be very welcome. Um, our friendly staff, you can even have a cup of tea here if you like. Um, you will enjoy our museum. Thank you. I spend a lot of time out here. The RT Charger's the real deal. An E49. Remember A Charger? I've always got projects on the go, so Shannon's laid up cover helps protect my restorations. I'm Mopar through and through. It's a passion Shannon's understands. I wouldn't insure my cars and bikes with anyone else. Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts. Call 13 46 46 for a quote. If you own a classic, make sure that it's insured with Shannon's. Why not pick up the phone and give Shannon's a call for a quote and a chat on 134646. And if you're enjoying classic restos, well, there's over 320 episodes awaiting you on the Shannon's Club, along with a whole heap of other cool productions as well, such as Shannon's Club TV, Legends of Motorsport, Driven, and End of an Era. It's all awaiting you at shannons.com.au. 
In 2020, why not consider a Detroit tour with Fletch? Detroit, the automotive epicenter. It will leave you gobsmacked. Imagine experiencing where automotive history on a grand scale began. Stay in fine accommodation, taking in some of the best museums and private car collections on the planet. Book your 2020 Detroit tour with Fletch. So, Bill, being an active volunteer here, I would hardly think it would be a chore leaving the house each day to come here. Yeah, Fletch, um, it's really good because I come down here most days. Um, there's always something to do. Um, cleaning cars, putting things away, deciding on new projects and, and just talking to the people to come through the door. It's excellent. It depicts so much history here. I love the signs on the wall, the old cans over there, the push bikes down there. The list just goes on and on and on. It, uh, it's quite deceiving, as you said earlier, from the street, and it's the wow factor when you get inside. Yeah, um, to be honest, uh, every time I walk in here, if you have a good look around, Fletch, you'll, you'll find something different every time. And it's, it's something that people don't see. They come through perhaps for an hour. Other people spend four hours here. And just go around again. It's great. The cross section of vehicles here is great too, Bill. We have some American cars. We have the American derivatives that were built here in Australia. We have some Australian classic cars. We have some British classic cars. Um, I just love the array of what's under one roof, and also some history there with the Portland tram system. Correct? Yeah, the tram originates um, out of Melbourne. It was built approximately 1917. Um, there's a good book out called Horror the War Dog, where was a, in the Second World War, uh, a fella over there had this little Jack Russell dog who saved the lives of many people, and they smuggled that dog back at, into Australia after the war. The fella that had that dog retired in the, in the Portland, and he lived in that cable car. So that's the story behind that. The machine behind us, Bill, I'm always fascinated about these. And Steve Moore at the Geelong the Steam Festival does a, a wonderful job there each year. And uh, an episode on Classic Restos a couple of times has showcased these incredible these steam machines that were, were used back in the day. Um, you've got one operating here. What's the, what's the deal with this one? Yeah, the, it's a big twin cylinder, Rust and Hornsbury. It's made in England in 1933. It was such a good design that they uh, fled made them right up to 1962. There was two models made. This one's 130 horsepower. It's 130 horsepower at 260 revs per minute. Um, the other model, the only difference between the two models was the diameter of the flywheel. But um, this one was in Portland, worked in a sawmill, and it worked there for many years, in, in the dust and the sawdust, etc., etc., and just keep working. Before that, a payload of um, power plant over at Murray Bridge. Again, there's ticked over 24 hours a day, seven days a week for many years. And then before that, it was in Brunswick in Melbourne, and we're not sure what it did there. I love the early technology, the workmanship that goes into crafting machines such as that. The size of the bore, the journals, the, the crank, the bearings, and the 130 odd horsepower at such low RPM. But then on top of that, the amazing amount of torque that this thing makes. The whole unit weighs just over nine tonne. And when it was in the, we started, as, it's an air start machine, we started on 110 PSI. When it was in the sawmill and under load, getting back to your torque, Fletch, um, they had to start under 250 pound PSI. And they used to run it on anything from kerosene to used oil, whatever was available. Do they have a decompression system at, at first crank, so to speak? Yeah, we've got to put it on a different um, cam setting um, on both cylinders. And once we get it turning over, we, we hit those knobs in, puts it on the normal camshaft, hold the uh, throttle flat out, and away it goes. And it can sit there for six months, and then we come along and it'll fire up straight away. It's excellent. I love the way the things run. They're so smooth and they're so quiet. They're such a, a monster of a machine. You, I mean, in terms of safety back in the day, uh, there's no safety shields around these things. You just have to really take responsibility to watch what you're doing 
operating these, even today you still have to do the same thing. But the generator, well, the air compressor over the back there, um, putting the, the air in, is noisier than what that machine is itself. It's just so graceful, it just ticks along there like a Rolex. Yeah, the, the, the machine, when it was in the sawmill, you wouldn't have heard it working. The, the saw blades going through the timber would have made a lot more noise. And here, the, we put it on a modern-day air compressor to pump air up into it. And that's, yeah, it's noisier than the machine. And it's, and it's super quiet. We have um, two 20-cent pieces sitting on, on top of it, and they do not move. And they're upright. It's dead, dead set quiet. Again, here we are, back with technology around 100 years, a century ago, and yet it is so precise and works just so well. Yeah, we, um, we, ha we have a, mo a motor vehicle in here, you know, 9009, and the technology in that, now this is back before the days of computers, etc., etc., and, uh, and we have trouble figuring out that technology today, even with computers. So these cars are, no, the, the, the 1900s, the, the 1920s, 30s, 40s, that was just an amazing era in, in technology. My passion for cars began when Nana and Pop bought their new Toyota Crown. It was Nana's, really. She loved that car. We went everywhere in it. My passion now is just the same, even though my cars are a little different. I've still got Nana's car, couldn't part with it. And I reckon if she was here today, she'd be insured with Shannon's too. Call Shannon's on 13 46 46. Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts. Heron Forbes Machinery House has been family owned and operated for over 85 years and it's easy to see why. Planning on welding? Look at these welding tables and clamps, air compressors and different air tools, sandblasting cabinets, through to spray guns. Everyone is welcome at Machinery House. There are competitive freight rates around Australia and you can buy online at machinerywhouse.com.au. So remember, Hare and Forbes has the range. So, Bill, you having fun? Yeah, I'm totally enjoying this. Um, it's been great. You know, we've had other crews down here as well, and no, it's a fun time, and it certainly Fletcher promotes the museum. Thank you, mate. It's great having Fletcher around, isn't it? It's good. He's a top bloke. <laughs> Talking of a top bloke or a top car, there's one right behind us. Now, this is a special car. It's a 1927 Essex, and I believe it's the uh, it's an original car to Portland. Yeah, it's an original car to Portland, and the family that own it uh, bought it new. Um, they bought it from Riley's Motor in Hamilton, and then it came to Portland. Um, it was, like most cars back in that era, it was cut down, fletched into a ute, um, but the current owner resurrected it some years back, uh, fully restored it, and it's a, a good going vehicle. Yeah, and it's, like I said, it's been registered under the same family by the same name um, since new. They had quite a bit of a following, the Essex, didn't they? Yeah, they were a popular car in the 20s. As there was a many a manufacturer, but sadly they declined and disappeared. I think in the 20s, uh, if you had a car in general, you were doing okay. But the Essex was designed, obviously, for the, the working class man, and uh, they sold plenty of them. Yeah, they were just a general run-of-the-mill car um, in competition with Ford and Chev, obviously, and, and the other American mates. But, um, yeah, they were a good, solid, reliable car. And when you look back at that, Bill, you've got to give them points for trying because at the end of the day, if you were a car manufacturer back in the 20s, would you really wanted to have been up against the big three? Would have been tough. Oh, definitely tough because you know there's so many parts of a of, of a motor vehicle. Fletch, as you know, that like there's a million parts, and they had to manufacture all these you know before the com computer era, then put them again, put them together, make them work, yeah. get them reliable, yeah. and then sell them. So yeah, it was tough times, but they were brave people. It was also the tooling to make the tools. It's almost came first the chicken or the egg. You look at the parts that were made for these cars uh, and then the equipment before them to come up with those parts. It's, a, it's incredible when you think of the history of manufacture. Yeah, they had some big presses and obviously the stamp out parts for the car and foundry setups um, to make the motors. But um, as the, the thing was big competition back then, uh, they, they changed their models every year. So they had to be spot on with their tooling. Uh, unreal people. Just imagine back in the 20s, Bill, being responsible for a manufacturing company building cars and you're up against the big three. 
Imagine how tough that would have been. Yeah, it was an amazing period of, 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 in the history of motor cars because you, know, you had your big three, your Ford, your GM and your Chrysler, and they were big companies, and you just had to compete with them. And to compete, and there were so many um, makes of cars then, and the Essex being one of them, um, they had to be on the ball. And here is a fun fact about Essex. They went into production in 1919, running through till 1932, and just over one million were made. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this week's combined episode of Classic Restos, of course, featuring Eddie Ford and his iconic Falcon stuck up in the tree, branching out to new heights. And of course, Bill and his team representing just some of the Portland Auto Museum. As I say at the end of every week's episode of Classic Restos, no matter where you're watching the show from, until next week, please ride and drive safe. I'm Fletch, and I thank you very much for watching. You can like and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash classic restos TV and watch catch up episodes at shannons.com.au. Classic Restos is proudly brought to you by Shannon's Insurance, where you can be a member of the Shannon's Club, Pace Farm the Enjoyable Egg, Hair and Forbes Machinery House, and Gun Lake Quarries.